Hi everyone, my name is Faustine Ramirez and I'm a master tutor with Med School Coach for Step 1 and Step 2. Today we'll be reviewing a Step 2 CK question in pediatrics. So let's start by reading the stem. A five-year-old boy is brought to the emergency department because of progressive right leg pain, decreased activity, and fevers for the past five days. His mother has noticed he also has had difficulty walking and bearing weight on the right side. He recently had a cold about two weeks ago with congestion, rhinorrhea, and malaise. He has had no recent falls, injuries, or trauma. Medical history includes atopic dermatitis and sickle cell disease. Temperature is 38.5, heart rate is 140, respiratory rate is 25, and blood pressure is 100 over 58. On examination, he appears uncomfortable and irritable. His pulses are strong and symmetric, and his capillary refill time is less than two seconds. Cardiopulmonary and abdominal examinations are unremarkable. He cries with passive range of motion of the lower extremity. The distal aspect of his right lower leg is very tender to palpation and slightly warm, but there is no skin or joint erythema or swelling. He is reluctant to bear weight, but is able to take a few steps. His gait is antalgic. Blood work demonstrates an ESR of 50, leukocytes of 15,000, platelets of 500,000, and normal electrolytes. Blood cultures and lower extremity plane films are pending. What is the next best step? So I'd like you to pause the video for a moment and try to work through this question on your own first. All right, so welcome back. So as always, the first step when we approach a question is going to be to read the last sentence, so to read the question itself. What is the next best step? So we identify that this is going to be a question about management, and then we briefly glance at the answer choices, and we see that they all involve either a medication or a procedure. So this is going to help us frame how we approach the question stem because we're already thinking that the answer is going to be some form of medication or procedure, some treatment. So let's start from the top and we'll highlight the key elements in the question stem. A five-year-old boy is brought to the emergency department because of progressive right leg pain, decreased activity, and fevers for the past five days. So the time frame here is going to be important. His mother has noticed he has also had difficulty walking and bearing weight on the right side. He recently had a cold about two weeks ago with congestion, rhinorrhea, and malaise. He has had no recent falls, injuries, or trauma. Medical history includes atopic dermatitis and sickle cell disease. So here, just based on the symptoms and the presentation, I highlighted the key elements from the past medical history, um, as well as the age, any risk factors that we noticed, um, and then the presentation. So right leg pain, decreased activity and fevers, and the time frame, which is important, five days. We always want to highlight abnormal vital signs as well, so we'll do that here. Temperature is 38.5, heart rate is 140, respiratory rate is 25, and blood pressure is 100 over 58. So here the patient is febrile and tachycardic, but is not tachypnic or hypotensive. We'll also highlight the abnormal parts of the examination. So on exam, he appears uncomfortable and irritable. His pulses are strong and symmetric. His capillary refill time is less than two seconds, so that's normal. Cardiopulmonary and abdominal examinations are unremarkable. He cries with passive range of motion of the lower extremity. So in kids, they're not always going to be able to tell you what hurts. And especially when they're younger, um, at around five, he may be able to say that his right leg hurts, but he might not be able to specify more than that. And so in kids, irritability, fussiness, and crying can be a sign of discomfort or pain or illness. So here, crying with passive range of motion gives us a sense that that's painful for him because he's crying. The distal aspect of his right lower leg is very tender to palpation and slightly warm, but there's no skin or joint erythema or swelling. So here we have focal examination findings in the distal aspect of the right lower leg with tenderness and a bit of warmth. So potentially some focal signs of inflammation, but we don't have any erythema or swelling of the skin or joint. So that's going to be important when we're thinking about our differential diagnosis.
He is reluctant to bear weight. And this is likely because it's painful. Again, in kids, crying and fussiness and reluctance to do things is an indication that it may be painful for them. He's able to take a few steps, but he's, his gait is antalgic. And then finally, for the labs, it's also important to highlight the abnormal labs. Blood work demonstrates an ESR of 50, which is elevated, a white blood cell count of 15,000, which is also elevated, platelets of 500,000, slightly elevated, and normal electrolytes. And then we're told blood cultures and lower extremity plane films are pending. So before we move on to the answer choices, let's take a moment to put some of these pieces together. So remember that it's important to take 10 to 15 seconds before we look at the answer choices to synthesize the findings from the question stem because most board's questions are two-step questions. The first step is to identify the diagnosis and the next step is to answer a question about the diagnosis. So we want to take 10 to 15 seconds to look at the key elements from the stem that we've highlighted, put those pieces together, synthesize them and come up with a diagnosis. So here we have a young child who's presenting with right leg pain, and fevers for five days. And he has a history of sickle cell disease, so this is important. And he's febrile and tachycardic on examination and has some focal findings in the right lower extremity that are concerning for pain and inflammation, okay? So the past medical history is important the specific findings, the symptoms he presented with, the focal findings on exam, and then final and the vital signs, and finally the lab markers of ESR being elevated, the leukocytosis, slightly elevated platelet count. So remember, platelets are um, an acute phase reactant, so they can be elevated in the setting of inflammation. Um, so the combination of these things, um, we're concerned about acute musculoskeletal pain in a patient with sickle cell disease. So it's important to briefly review what is the differential diagnosis for musculoskeletal pain in patients with sickle cell disease. So if this was um, an otherwise healthy patient, we might have a different differential diagnosis. It might include things like transient synovitis. Um, it might in include like healthy perfs. Um, it would also include things like septic arthritis, osteomyelitis, cellulitis. And in patients with sickle cell disease, we have to broaden our differential um, because of their underlying medical condition. And so in patients with sickle cell disease, we broaden that differential to also include things like um, acute pain crises, um, as well as avascular necrosis. Um, and we would still include osteomyelitis. So let's briefly review this differential um, of musculoskeletal pain in sickle cell patients. And it's really gonna be these three things that most of the questions are going to go after. If they want to go after transient synovitis or like calvary perth or just a run of the mill cellulitis, um, they wouldn't necessarily give you the past medical history of sickle cell disease. Here, this is really a key element um, where they're asking you to review the differential diagnosis specifically in sickle cell disease, the differential diagnosis of musculoskeletal pain specific to sickle cell disease, not just your run of the mill differential diagnosis for fever and a limp in all patients. So let's review that differential now briefly. So musculoskeletal pain in sickle cell patients, the first thing that's really important to remember is going to be vaso-occlusive crises. So vaso-occlusive crises present with very acute onset, so several days, hours to days of severe pain. And typically they're going to be in more than one site. Um, commonly it's going to be in the back, in the chest, the abdomen, the extremities, and it's often going to be associated with dactylitis. So remember dactylitis, corresponds to these vaso-occlusive pain crises, specifically in the small bones of the hands and feet. And sometimes it's described as sausage digits. Um, it, kinda lo it can look like this, where the fingers are puffy, they're swollen, they look like sausages. So they might not give you the word dactylitis, but they might give you a picture or they might describe 
um, in specific terms like puffy, swollen, sausage appearing, tense, those types of terms. So you have to know to recognize that description and to know that they're talking about dactylates. The patients may have a low-grade fever, but fever is not typically the prominent part of the presentation. So it's going to be pain more than fever. And it can sometimes be triggered by dehydration or infection, stress and illness, or it could just come on without a trigger. And the treatment of these vaso-occlusive crises is going to hinge upon analgesia, um, and that's typically going to be with NSAIDs, as well as opiates if needed. So if it's really severe pain, you might need to use IV opiates, um, including IV morphine or IV hydromorphone. Um, you could try oral pain medications, um, but in severe pain, you might require both opiates and NSAIDs. And then it's also going to hinge upon hydration. This is really a key element of treating these vaso-occlusive crises. So the combination of appropriate analgesia and hydration is going to be how you treat these vaso-occlusive crises. Now, the next thing on your differential for musculoskeletal pain in a patient with sickle cell disease is going to be avascular necrosis, also called osteonecrosis. Now, in contrast to the vaso-occlusive crises, avascular necrosis is more of a chronic progressive pain. Okay, so this could be on the order of weeks to months, but it's not going to present in a few days. So the time frame when we're talking about our differential for musculoskeletal pain in patients with sickle cell is really important. So it's chronic on the order of weeks to months, and it's most typically going to be in one site, and classically it's in the humeral or in the femoral head. You won't get any fever or constitutional symptoms, right? And you won't get any warmth, swelling, or erythema. It's mainly gonna be this chronic pain that sometimes can be hard to localize on exam. You might get limitations in range of motion or pain with range of motion, but you're not gonna have these very focal findings as you would, for example, in osteomyelitis. And the treatment for this is that eventually, um, if it's severe enough, these patients may need a joint replacement. Um, so we really try to prevent this from happening um, and to catch it early. And the classic findings, um, this is a radiograph of bilateral hip osteonecrosis. Um, and so you can see that here and here. And you see that femoral head really looks abnormal. Um, it doesn't have a nice rounded shape that you kind of see flattening. Um, the, the, entire femoral head looks very abnormal. And so you should be able to recognize this in an x-ray. If you're given the x-ray, you should be able to recognize avascular necrosis on imaging. It won't always be bilateral. Sometimes it might be just unilateral, um, but you kind of see it decomposing and flattening and, and that femoral head just looks, um, that bone there just looks very abnormal compared to bone over here, for example. And then finally, also in your differential for musculoskeletal pain in a patient with sickle cell disease is going to be osteomyelitis. And osteomyelitis can present more acute to subacutely, so days to a few weeks. So slightly longer than the vaso-occlusive crises, although certainly on the order of several days is possible. And it's most commonly gonna be just in one site and you will have fever and constitutional symptoms like fatigue, irritability, poor feeding, um, and you're also going to have very focal findings on examination. So that might include warmth. It might include swelling. It's very classically going to have point tenderness at the site of the bone infection. And patients will also present with limitations of function. So this might be limping. It might be kids who are not willing to use one of their extremities. So maybe if it's in the upper extremity, they might not be willing to use that upper extremity or they might not be willing to step on that foot to bear weight on that foot. So they might just bear weight on one leg instead of the other, or they might refuse to bear weight altogether. So in younger kids, this might present with kids who were previously walking, who are wanting to be held more, or who are now only crawling. They're kind of regressing in their motor milestones. These are all signs um, that could point you towards osteomyelitis or just impaired range of motion in general. So the constellation of 
the fever and constitutional symptoms plus focal findings on examination um, suggestive of focal inflammation as well as limitation of function in some way should be a major clue um, that we're talking about osteomyelitis. And you might also see this presentation in septic arthritis, uh, but the difference there is that the joint space, the joint fluid will be infected rather than the bone itself. So you won't have focal bony tenderness. Um, you might still have impaired range of motion, but these focal bone findings are more specific to osteomyelitis rather than septic arthritis. You're also going to have elevated inflammatory markers. So ESR, CRP, your what blood cell count will be elevated. And in terms of treatment, the treatment differs slightly in patients who have sickle cell disease. So remember that in patients who don't have sickle cell disease, the more common pathogens are going to be most commonly staph aureus, staph aureus, and staph aureus, as well as maybe group A strep, some other gram positives, um, in younger patients, you might think about Kingella, but in patients with osteomyelitis, you have to remember about your gram negatives. And it's really important to remember salmonella as a major pathogen in patients with sickle cell disease. So normally we would just treat empirically with vancomycin or clindamycin, um, which covers Staph aureus and MRSA. But in patients with sickle cell disease, we need to add ceftriaxone because we also need to cover gram-negative rods, including most importantly, salmonella, in addition to the typical pathogens. So when we're thinking about our differential diagnosis for musculoskeletal pain in sickle cell patients, we need to remember osteomyelitis, vasoocclusive crises, and avascular necrosis, in addition to the other things that are on our differential for um, musculoskeletal pain and limping in kiddos, including um, Skiffy, um, like Calvae Perths, or transient synovitis, as well as juvenile idiopathic arthritis. But these three are very specific to sickle cell. So let's take a look at our question again, now that we've reviewed that. And let's point out a few things from the question stem that were really important clues. So we have the time frame again being really important, five days of fevers plus pain and weight-bearing difficulties. Now, this recent cold was really there as a distractor, as a red herring. It was supposed to make you think of transient synovitis, which can present with pain and refusal to bear weight and limping within a few weeks, typically one to four weeks after a recent upper respiratory infection or some viral infection. Um, but here there are too many things pointing us towards osteomyelitis. Um, transient synovitis um, wouldn't have fevers like this, wouldn't have these elevated inflammatory markers, wouldn't have these focal findings on exam. So this was here as a red herring to trick you into thinking that we were talking about transient synovitis. Now this patient has sickle cell disease. That's the crux of this question here because it altogether changes our differential diagnosis. The patient is, uh, has a fever and has tachycardia, and that's likely tachycardia because of the fever. Um, and the exam really is notable mainly for these very focal findings, the tenderness to palpation, um, specifically in the distal aspect and some warmth, as well as the antalgic gait and the elevated inflammatory markers. Um, so putting all of these pieces together, this picture in terms of our differential for musculoskeletal pain in patients with sickle cell is a slam dunk for osteomyelitis. Now it's really important to get our blood cultures and they tell us those are pending, as well as some imaging. And you might start with plain films. MRI is also really useful in the diagnosis of osteomyelitis, but this wasn't a question about workup or diagnosis. This is a question about management and treatment. So they ask us, what is the best next step? So in a patient with sickle cell disease presenting with a fever, we always wanna start antibiotics as quickly as possible. Definitely once we have our blood cultures pending. So if in doubt, and you weren't sure about any of these other answer choices, they could have sounded right, you would have known that in a patient with sickle cell disease who's at risk of having serious bacterial infections, we want to start our antibiotics as quickly as possible. So that's one big picture thing to remember um, in terms of these boards questions on sickle cell patients. Sickle cell patients plus a fever 
always get your antibiotics started quickly. So we could have narrowed it down to C or D without even knowing exactly what was going on. Now let's look at these answer choices in a bit more detail and see what they were going after. So because of what we learned already, we know that the correct answer is vancomycin plus ceftriaxone to cover both our usual pathogens and our gram-negative rods. But what were these other answer choices going after? So ibuprofen, certainly pain management analgesia is going to be important, and we want an antipyretic as well. So ibuprofen is certainly useful in this case, but it wouldn't be the next best step because we want to start our antibiotics quickly in this patient, right? This patient is at risk of having serious complications from this bacterial infection of getting really sick, could potentially get septic. So we want to start, start our antibiotics as quickly as possible. So ibuprofen, sure, but not the best next step. Now, this would be useful for transient synovitis. This is the management for transient synovitis. And remember, they're trying to trick you here with um, the antecedent viral illness that they told us about. Now, what about morphine? Morphine would have been the right answer if this was a vaso-occlusive crisis. But in this case, we've identified that it's not and that it's osteomyelitis. Now, immediate surgical screw fixation. This is the correct answer when you're thinking about Skiffy, but this was not part of the presentation at all. We didn't have an obese um, preteen or older child um, presenting with a limp. Skiffy, you wouldn't have a fever, you wouldn't have inflammation, um, the issues in the hip, so you wouldn't have these focal findings in the leg. So again, um, this is here to trick you because it's on the differential for a limp in a young child, um, but it doesn't have any of the features that are consistent with Skiffy in the question stem. Incision and drainage would be appropriate if this was a cellulitis, and cellulitis could present with fevers and leg pain. Cellulitis right here, um, could present with fevers, leg pain, potentially some focal findings, tenderness, erythema, um, and, but the incision and drainage is really going to be important, especially when we have an abscess, if there's something drainable. And here, we're not giving any findings on exam that are consistent with a drainable fluid collection. So they might, in that case, they might mention fluctuants, or they might mention that there's fluid that's palpable, um, but nothing about this exam is concerning for uh, an abscess or specifically a cellulitis. It's, this is gonna be a bone infection, um, more specifically osteomyelitis, and nothing on exam here gives us a sense that there's a drainable fluid collection. So although this could have been correct if we were dealing just with a cellulitis, um, there's no abscess here to drain. And then finally, hip replacement. This might be the correct answer in avascular necrosis. It would also be the correct answer in leg calve perths. But again, um, the presentation here is much too acute. It's only been going on for five days to be avascular necrosis. Um, and so that time frame is so important because it helps us tease apart the different causes of musculoskeletal pain. And this time frame could be consistent with vaso-occlusive crises, although it would probably be even more acute. It would probably be on the order of hours to days. Five days is um, would be a little bit long, although it could still be possible, but certainly too short for avascular necrosis. So then finally, we have C and D are two antibiotic choices, and vancomycin would be appropriate if this was osteomyelitis in an otherwise healthy child. So this is really important. In an otherwise healthy child, you don't need gram-negative coverage for osteomyelitis, but in a child with sickle cell disease, you need to remember your gram-negative coverage, especially for salmonella. And this is a really high yield point, and this will get tested um, most certainly on your step GCK exam and on your pediatrics shelf. So remember your gram-negative coverage for osteomyelitis in sickle cell patients. So that wraps up our question of the week. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.